Welcome back to another episode of the NWN Podcast. Again, we're coming back to my self-interview with Jay Campbell. Uh, we'll go into the topics that we didn't cover last time. And uh, yeah, we'll try to cover more grounds this time. So Jason, you want to introduce yourself again to the audience? Yeah, again, uh, Jason Campbell. I've been uh, a friend of y'all's case for uh I don't know how many years now and uh, working uh, with the label for a long time. Uh, I do have some more questions we'll go over in a minute. I think you wanted to talk a little bit about Helios right now. Yeah, so let me start out with some news about the Helios pressing plant just to get that out of the way. Um, so we decided not to use Kickstarter. Um, I just came to the realization that it's not much more than an e-commerce site, and it's more suited for people who just don't have any audience to start out with. Since NWN already has a built-in audience and um, we have a lot of followers on Instagram, we decided that it was better to just run it through the online shop. So the way these things usually work is you take pre-orders and um, you create an incentive program and uh, for those who don't have the funds to create them, that the funds are generated by Kickstarter. And that's how usually things work for Kickstarter. But on our side, since we already have a thriving business with NWN, we have the means of creating the incentive items like pre-ordered LPs, T-shirts, tote bags, and so on. I just thought that it was much easier. And um, I think in the end, it will be more profitable, so to speak. It, it, I think it'll be more successful to do it through the online uh, NWN shop because Kickstarter takes 10%. So I guess the calculus was, would Kickstarter bring in 10% or more non-metal people to buy my stuff, like Blasphemy, Goat Lord, and so on, which I'll show you in a second. I have some very special items that were... Uh, we're going to have as part of this Kickstarter, or sorry, uh, NWN uh, Helios fundraiser. So let me just share my screen really quick to show you the stuff that we're planning. Well, do you want to also point out how, I mean, this this stage, you and your business partner have invested a lot of your own resources. There's a little bit more to go. And right. that's why you're looking for input from... yeah 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 i've totally forgot to mention why we're doing a fundraiser i, I kind of figured that everyone knows at this point but obviously not everyone knows so um yeah we've gone we've taken this project as far as we could using our own money so we've already purchased a building we didn't rent it we didn't you know get a loan to buy it we just straight up bought a building we bought four vinyl pressing machines. Those are also paid for. We're not renting those or, you know, financing those. So we've invested a significant amount of money, amount of money into this project already. Uh, at this point, the next stage is to get the boiler and chiller system. So that's what the fundraiser is for. The boiler produces the steam that's used to melt the plastic and the chiller creates cold water that hardens the plastic. So as part of this campaign, I'm going to roll out five limited edition records. Um, I've selected five classics from the NWN roster. And obviously the first one is Fallen Angel Doom. Second is gonna be Conquer War Cult Supremacy. Third is Goat Lord Reflections of the Solstice. And the next is a very special Sabbath record, um, a Japanese Sabbath. So that's this one on the bottom here with a different logo than you, you're used to seeing. This logo was drawn in 1984 by Gizol himself, and it's spelled in a Japanese phonetic. So it says Sabato, because that's how you would write it. Three letters in Japanese, Sabato. So there's an extra O, and it's holding on to an inverted cross. So the, the reason why I chose this is because they found just recently some unfinished tracks that were recorded in the 80s. Um, well, and finished in 1994 and 2013. So it wasn't all recorded in um, in the 80s. Uh, I think it was recorded partially in 84 and 88. 
uh it's two tracks mayans hill and blackfire the same two tracks that appear on the first seven inch by Sabbath, so this is going to be pretty pretty special. We'll put two tracks on one side from the Lost Sessions, and then we'll put the original 1984 7-inch tracks, the re same recordings, um, on side B. So, And note that all the records are going to be um, printed on sheet metal. So we haven't figured out the logistics or how we're going to, you know, encase the vinyl in this yet but it'll be something like a square sheet metal um that's stiff enough to give it more um i don't know some structure it's not going to be this floppy aluminum foil thing we'll either print on it that's similar you, you did that a long time ago with uh, right. your first revenge release right yes we did a similar thing with revenge except that was a uh, that was a bit more flimsy and it had an actual pocket. This time, I think what we're going to do is either one sheet of thick sheet metal or two sheets, depending on how much these things end up costing. The, the rising cost of steel might throw a wrench into this, but we'll make it something very interesting for, um, for the supporters. So uh, yeah, we'll either uh, laser etch the artwork on there or we will silk screen it. Yeah. But so lastly, the I also forgot to mention Departure Chandelier as well. Yeah, that's too. what I was going to say. So the last record is going to be Departure Chandelier Antichrist Rise to Power because that's quickly becoming a classic in our roster. And yeah, it's it's a fan fan favorite as well right now. So we'll do these five records in addition to some patches, uh, t shirt, and tote bag. And, uh, the price for these will be a little bit higher than usual, but I've come up with a pretty good um, idea where I bundle the record with some sort of a discount code where you know the the supporter gets discount on NW and orders for X number of months. So this kind of balances out the higher price price tag on these fundraiser items. Yeah. So enough for about this uh, fundraiser we can jump into. Uh, well, I guess the last thing is how soon is that going live? Oh yeah, sorry, that was a very good. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's gonna go live March first, and I've already started to construct the the sites on our site. Uh, on can started to construct the pages, I guess, uh, on our on, uh, online shop. So people should go there and bookmark it now. Um, we're planning on going live with everything. March 1st and we'll run it for a month or maybe two months until we we reach that goal. That's the other uh, benefit to not using Kickstarter. We don't have to have a set end date because the factory is not going to be ready for uh, close to one year from now. Um, the target is to open up this winter, um, hopefully before the end of the year, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, so not having, you know, to abide by Kickstarter's rule of having a set end date, I think really helps as well. I mean, certain things will have an end date just because we have to start manufacturing. We need to know how many to manufacture, but something like a t-shirt or a tote bag or whatever, we can, you know, we can just keep those up forever. Oh, in addition to actual products, we'll also offer services like um, we're partnering with Enormous Store Mastering to offer audio mastering for vinyl. And just by dumb luck, or good luck maybe, um, a professional recording studio just opened up literally on the same block as us. And uh, they're used to recording heavier bands, not so many metal bands or punk bands, but they recorded bands like the Swans. So uh, the studio is called um, Point West Studios. They're just pretty much just two buildings away from us. And we started talking to them about partnering. So we might offer some sort of a service where we bundle recording, uh, mastering, mixing, and maybe discount on vinyl pressing as well. So it's kind of an A to Z solution for a band that's just starting out. So we'll do something very interesting for the services section as well. All right, well, do you wanna um, go ahead and uh, get into the follow up on uh, our last interview. Yeah, let's do that. Let's jump okay. right in. Well, one of the things I was thinking about that I don't know if we 
specifically covered, but you know, what is it that you, you were talking about being young, being an adolescent, being into punk and hardcore, and uh, when you lived in around the DC area, how did you get drawn into metal, and why has metal kept you, um, you know, invested in it for so long? Why why are you still you still consider yourself a metal fan? Um, so as I discussed in the previous, uh, podcast, I was skateboarding a lot in my preteen and teenage years. And, um, through the, the skateboarding community, I met some interesting people who were into underground music. One of them was this Peruvian immigrant named Francisco. And sometimes he'll email me to this day. I have no idea what he's doing now. He's a full grown adult, just like me. Uh, but at the time he was a skater and his brother uh, was into metal. He had an older brother. Usually this is how things work, right? You're, you grow up in a family and some sibling introduces you to interesting music or your father or your mother. Um, so that definitely happened for me. My sisters were into punk rock, so they introduced me to punk as well. And then, like I discussed in the previous interview, um, my tutor also introduced me to punk, but metal came from Francisco, I think. That's where the lineage goes back to. So Francisco's brother was heavily into underground metal at the time. The stuff that, uh, maybe not so underground anymore but stuff like carcass napalm death dri you know these are all very big names now but in 1988 1989 they were still somewhat underground they were bigger in that scene even back then uh but yeah th just imagine you know i was maybe like 12 or 13 hearing carcass you know reek of putrefaction for the first time it just sounded like a bunch of uh grinding noise so at, at the time, I don't think I fully grasped the significance of that music. I just heard a bunch of noise. I was used to hearing linear and, you know, very easy to listen to punk rock stuff, um, like Minor Threat or something like that, you know, very catchy songs and very simple. And then I heard Carcass for the first time, and that really changed my mind. So Yeah, I, I, I got lucky enough to see carcass open up for death when i was in seventh grade on the spiritual healing tour and that was i i couldn't even wrap my mind around what carcass was doing at the time at that age it was yeah yeah astounding. yeah that's crazy i guess that was like symphonies of sickness tour or something right i can't remember i mean i didn't know who they were deceased played first then carcass mm -hmm. and then uh death and i only knew death at the time uh yeah so that was it took it actually took me a few years before I realized sort of how important what I had witnessed was at the time I had no context mm -hmm. for it. So um well so and I know you also had uh who's your friend that um in DC that is in enemy soil? There's another Oh yeah. So uh in high school I met a friend Vaughn Courier, I think he's still around, and until just recently, he used to order from me just once in a while. So he was somewhat of a mentor as well. Um, he was a little bit older than me, so he knew a bit more about the underground. He showed me stuff like the Wild Rags catalog, you know, uh, Nuclear Death. I remember in 94 or something, we went to... New York City to visit my sister and Vaughn came along and we went to Bleaker Bob's uh that famous record store that's in Seinfeld it's a it was like a underground punk metal store where almost all the bands went through and sold their demos through so we went there and I remember I forgot what record I bought it was something stupid you know in hindsight I was like I was in a great record store and I bought this stupid thing it, it was one of those scenarios, you know, Vaughn, of course, found like nuclear death, uh, nuclear death records on Wild Rags at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, he knew what he was doing. Um, so yeah, he was, he introduced me to the more deep underground stuff that, you know, I was, I was still naive to. So this was like early, early nineties sometime. Well, so, I mean, those, 
like the history sort of covers the how, but now what about the why? Why why did metal speak to you then and why does it continue to do so now? Well, yeah, I don't know. Um I think there is a subjective, you know, taste in music. Metal speaks to me better than than punk does. I think punk punk has a very youthful energy that appealed to me as a teenager. And I guess some metal does as well to younger people, but um, the the fact that punk is very much grounded in the the reality at hand, you know, they talk about politics and, you know, straight edge and all these uh, real world topics. Metal is more of an escapism. Metal touches on topics that are transcendental in some ways, some mythical, sometimes religious, sometimes anti-religious, sometimes anti-authority. Um, I think as an adult, it's a lot more of an interesting musical experience to listen to metal for that reason. And obviously the, the music itself, not just the topic that they're covering, but the music itself is a lot more intricate. Um, or has the power to become completely stripped down like the old Jarn t-shirt you're wearing there. You know, they strip it down all the way to its core, uh, just like punk does, but explore other themes that are otherworldly. Um, you know, the power of nature is something that old Jarn probably covers, even though I don't read Norwegian. I just get that feeling from the music and the, the pictures. Um yeah, all the way down to the most intricate type of metal, like Watchtower or, you know, Stargazer. So I think metal music just has more potential uh, built into it that appeals to me. Yeah, I, I always felt like punk and hardcore is, is very much rooted in angst and like, yeah. you know, youthful most angst. people grow out of that at some point. Yeah, it's a, I always find it a little bit weird when... Um, older guys like people my age are still singing like seven seconds songs or something you know yeah young till i die or something i i mean i get i get the sentiment but i just can't really take that seriously you know maybe i'm just jaded well what do you think i mean at this point you you, you just kind of said you know metal can be stripped down to the the elements or it can be very intricate and do you think that we're reaching sort of the end of what metal can accomplish? Or do you think there's a lot more ground left to cover? That's a hard question. Um, it's it's <laughs> who the who the hell knows? Um I like to think that metal is backwards looking and forward looking at the same time. And the best bands are those that really understand its history going all the way back to the 70s to the hardcore, I mean, sorry, hard rock roots and understand everything from hard rock, heavy metal to extreme metal, just like Stargazer is, um, and still create something refreshing and new. So I, I think I keep on bringing up Stargazer because I think they're the most innovative band that's still grounded in traditional metal. You know, they're, it's nothing except metal i think and people say it's prog but i think it's it takes influences from prog and other types of music maybe but it's 100 percent metal in my opinion so I, I think the best bands are those that take the elements of the old and somehow through some sort of magical metal alchemy they create something interesting out of them you know bands like negative plane bands like uh, even Kaixel, you know, they're they're stripped down. They're very raw and not the most musically proficient, but they're creating something brand new. Same You're referring to to the Portuguese band. Yeah, that, the Portuguese band. That's actually I, one one man, right? It's one yeah, guy. One man band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, bands like Aries Kingdom is creating something very traditionally death thrash, but coming up with new ideas and uh, pushing the boundaries. Um, so did you decide to start a label primarily because, you know, you, you love the music, but you don't play an instrument. Was that the, or was there something more specific that led you to want to 
start a label? That was probably it. Um, if I, you know, if I, if I was a musician, maybe I would have made music instead and uh, not done a label. I don't know. Um, I think it's also like a left brain, right brain thing where certain people are better suited to run um, labels rather than make music. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know where, I guess I'm more, I don't know which is which actually, but I'm probably more skewed to one side than the other. I'm, st I still consider myself a creative person, especially visually, but musically, I don't, I don't think my brain is made for it. I've tried playing music in the past and failed miserably. Um, <laughs> I do regret that I spent so much time skateboarding in my youth and not, you know, learn an instrument instead. I, and everyone says I, I, I can still do it. Uh, but as everyone knows, as you get older, it's much harder to learn a new skill. Yeah. Uh, just like a language, a kid picks up languages just like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, as an adult, it's much harder to learn something new. So, I mean, I'm not saying that it's never going to happen, but I'm 48 years old. I have a brand new factory and I got a kid on the way. I'm a bit busy. Yeah, in sixth or seventh grade, I started skateboarding and I sucked so bad that I stopped skateboarding and bought a guitar. I actually, I had a guitar, but I got a new one. I started taking it more seriously then. Um Unfortunately, I never got extremely good at that either, but I was better at playing guitar than I was at skateboarding. But you um, don't have the foundation to learn it still. You know, I yeah. don't even have the foundation. It's kind of like trying to learn how to skateboard now. Now, I can still get on a skateboard and roll around. I don't think I can even ollie up a curve at this point. Um, but if I really apply myself, I could probably you know, relearn skateboarding if I had to. Um, but I, since I never learned how to play guitar or any, any instrument except for saxophone, my mom made me play the saxophone in middle school and I sucked at that. Uh, my mom was a jazz fan. I had no idea you played saxophone. Yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a little secret. <laughs> and I found the saxophone just recently um, and I gave it to Mika, my daughter. I don't know what she did with it. Well, so in terms of how the label began, you know, it's a story that, that you know you and I both know and you've told several times, but in the event someone hasn't heard it before, you know, Live Ritual, the Blasphemy record was sort of the the real catalyst. I mean, you, you've done like a bootleg, you know, enslaved CDR and some kind of stuff like that, but like the the real what I see as the real beginning of the label was your the opportunity you had to record blasphemy during uh, uh, the reunion shows. Yeah. Um, can you kind of tell that story uh, again? Some people have already heard it, but some probably haven't. So. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, one of these situations that, really changes the course of your life and you don't realize it until much later. And it was a bunch of events that sort of aligned perfectly to form this situation. Um, at the time I was working for a biotech company called Silicon Genetics. They made software for data analysis, gene expression data analysis. And I was, I was in the tech support department and part of the job was to teach people how to use the software and they would send me to different cities. Um, so at the time in 20 or 2001, so maybe summer or something in 2001, um, they flew me to Chicago and I had to teach a class, which I did. Um, and, and during that trip, I actually remember meeting Mark from Metal Haven. His shop had just opened up. So I went in there and I remember giving him the, the enslaved bootleg CDR and it was like limited to 10 copies or something. I gave him one of those. And, uh, I, yeah, on the way back from Chicago, um, my flight got delayed or canceled. I don't, I don't remember what happened exactly, but they offered me a voucher, a flight voucher anywhere in North, North America. So I took that home and I didn't think anything of it. So a month or two goes by, um, blast for me announces a bunch of gigs 
I think there was one or two gigs before the one that I went to in July. Um, and there was one that happened in August as well. So I, I chose to go to the one in July. It was July 13th, 2001. It was a Friday gig. That's why it's called um, Live Ritual Friday the 13th. Um, and if you remember, I had this mini disc player with the microphone attached to it that we use for recording various bullshit. Um, I, I borrowed it for a long time. I remember I recorded, I went to see Incantation yeah. and, I lived in and uh, a few other bands I recorded and right. we would trade those mini discs back and forth and stuff. Yeah. 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 So the mini disc actually originated from my uncle who had gotten it from my mom to record live jazz concerts in Washington, D.C. So, you know, my uncle was actually very supportive of us. Um, he had his own company and he was, he was very wealthy, I mean, by Japanese standards. So uh, he paid for part of my education as well. So uh, very thankful for Hiroshi's help. Um, yeah, so... I took the recorder, the mini disc recorder up to Vancouver. Um, I was in touch with Justin from uh, All Father, um, Jay from Godless North, and Ryan Forster from Conqueror. He was also playing in Blasphemy already by then. So I met up with them. They showed me around. Um, we ended up hanging out at Jay's place. I think that's where I crashed as well. And uh, I asked the Blasphemy guys because I got introduced to them whether I could record the set. Um, and they said it was okay. So I recorded it on my MD player, mini disc player, and uh, played it for them after the gig. And that that's basically it. I asked them for permission to release it. They were okay with it. So that's how this connection to Blasphemy happened in 2001. So and how did the, more, the rehearsal get recorded? Which one? Oh, yeah, the rehearsal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the first pressing of Live Ritual, the Die Hard version came with the CDR of a rehearsal that happened a month later. That's when the they played the better gig with Black Witchery. I think it was August 29th, 2001, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. So I sent the mini disc up to Ryan Forster and he recorded it for me. And there's actually even a VHS recording of, of that same rehearsal. And the significance of that rehearsal is that they were playing new songs at the time. So I got to record Victory, Son of the Dam. That's the one new song they wrote back then. They had one other song. I don't remember the title, but that one didn't get recorded. They didn't play that song during the rehearsal. So... Victory Son of the Dam to this day only exists on that one rehearsal and it's a it's a really killer song. Um the whole rehearsal is actually I mean that's actually a, a really good recording because yeah, yeah I don't... the energy of the band has you know pretty good sound for a rehearsal recording. That that mini disc player act or recorder actually worked pretty well. Yeah, I don't I don't even know um why they discontinued that technology because it was very useful for recording things like this. So, yeah, that, that rehearsal sounds great. It's one of my favorite Blasphemy recordings, along with the classics, Yeah. So, um, you, at the time, you were living in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because you left Virginia, I want to say, what was it, 1997? Yeah, 98? it was 97. So, I started VCU in 95, two years at VCU. Um, we both worked our asses off to keep our straight A's. We were fucking nerds back then. And I mean, my, I had an agenda. I wanted to get out. I wanted to get out of Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. it wasn't that I didn't really like, I just wanted to see something else, you know, when you're young and, and you want to, you want to explore things that that's, that's the only way at that age, you, you can't just move somewhere and get a job so easily. I guess you could, but the easiest way for a student to move is to just get into a different university. So that's what I did. Um, I knew about Berkeley and California because in my teenage years, I went there to skateboard. Um, I went there with my friend, Chris Jones. We were in San Diego for a bit 
And I took the train up to the Bay Area. I skated in San Francisco. And I visited UC Berkeley. Well, it was more like I wanted to visit um, Amoeba and Rasputin. <laughs> but I made an excuse to go to Berkeley because I told my mom that I wanted to go see what UC Berkeley looked like. And I actually kept my promise. And at the end, you know, I transferred to UC Berkeley and I went there for two years. So it wasn't for just nothing. So, yeah, um, that was an interesting, that was an interesting thing to do. Just work ass, work, work my ass off for two years and then transfer to UC Berkeley. And then realize that I was at the bottom. I was just like an average student or a little bit lower than average, you know, Going from VCU to Berkeley was a huge, um, huge step because, as you know, UC Berkeley is very well known for their biology programs. Everyone who went there were, you know, top-notch students. I was competing with the smartest people in that field. Did you, um, <clears throat> what was your impression of Bay Area, like the metal scene there, both, you know, the at the time as well as like the history of metal in the bay area before you moved out there was that something that that drew you to oh yeah to... yeah yeah i mean everyone everyone knows about the bay area metal scene of the 80s with you know the classic bands metallica possessed uh black death sacrilege i mean there there are so many bands that came out of the bay area that made a huge impact on the metal scene um exodus as well so I knew that going in and I was expecting a stronger metal scene, but what I found was a very strong punk scene that sort of tangentially had a metal component to it, um, much like Austin, actually. Austin's a very much uh, punk scene. So, you know, I ended up going to a bunch of uh, metal shows or, you know, metal adjacent type of shows at the Gilman and, uh, I found out much later that Blasphemy had played the Gilman. Um, so that that's kind of an interesting tidbit. Yeah, they played uh, in 1990, I believe, when they came down to visit Wild Rags. So they were going through California. They, they were driving from Vancouver all the way down to LA. The infamous the Wild Rags uh, confrontation. Yeah, I don't know how, I mean, I think that story gets kind of overblown. I don't even know if it was a big confrontation. I, I know, I have a video of them going to the Wild Rags store and everything seemed pretty normal. It didn't seem like they were fighting or anything. So I think maybe that story got overblown over time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The um, But so were you a fan of a lot of that, the Bay Area metal before you arrived? Yeah, I mean, I knew the classics, you know, Exodus, Bonded by Blood, Metallica, Kill em All. I can't yeah, say right now. I'm I'm only walking distance right now from Paul Bailoff's grave, and I'm not too far away from uh, the Metallica house where they live. Right. Yeah, and yeah. Ruthie's Inn's down the street from you on San Pablo. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it's a lot of history. Yeah, there's a ton of history in uh, in Berkeley and the Bay Area. I mean, obviously, like. Later on, I did, you know, I discovered Bond. They played the Stone, you know, uh, the Omni. Both of these venues were very big in the metal scene back then. And I think one of those, I forgot which is which, but I think the Omni is is a building on San Pablo near you. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember. I know that there's somewhere somewhere around there. I know where Ruthie's is or where you know it was. Yeah, uh, the Harry's Kingdom guys were very excited to go visit it when they came just to see that i mean it's crazy to think about the history that went on it's a bookstore or something now but right yeah it happened in that building yeah people don't realize how significant that venue was and in fact you know the name eastern front records was taken from eastern front live at ruthie's inn that famous compilation of live recordings made at ruthie's inn it just made sense because of you know <clears throat> eastern front um bay area east and you know japan is to the east so it kind of made sense that i would take that name well by the time you got to the bay area obviously you know you you weren't going to be working with metallica at that point but obviously. you did you did find a community of of bands in uh in the the bay area that you started to sort of 
you know, mine their uh, work for the first releases on your label. I'm thinking more Bolsidad, Asunder, mm-hmm. Bon, Bone All, Black Goat. You know, you had a lot yeah. of these. Um, why, why did you, so how did that happen? How did that come about? Um, it was a combination of just being part of the underground, going to gigs and going to record stores and meeting people. So as you know, the Bay Area has some of the best record stores. Um, it's not as good as it used to be, but back when I first moved there, Amoeba was like a mecca for record stores, right? You could go there and find the craziest stuff. I remember going there and finding like Yellow Goat on the wall. I bought Graveland Records, First Press on No Colors, like Morbid, December Moon on Reaper. Just crazy stuff like that. Sabbath 666 Live, just on the shelf, you know. It's not the kind of stuff that you see in record stores even. It wasn't the case even back then. So it was... It was one of the only record stores in the world that had a big metal section. Same same with Rasputin's. It wasn't as good, but Rasputin's had a pretty good CD selection and a couple of vinyl. Um, I think I picked up Blast Me Gods of War there for pretty cheap. But yeah, um, I would I would go there almost like a religious pilgrimage almost every week. You know, I would go there. After class, I would go there whenever I had spare time and spare money. I would go there and go to both record stores and just dig through this stuff. And on one of these trips at Rasputin's, I was in the black metal section. I met John Gossard from uh, Weakling. I'm not sure if Weakling was going at the time. Maybe it was. I don't remember. But I distinctly remember having a conversation with them about French black metal and Iljarn because we were looking at the CDs and um, it was it must have been like uh, I think I asked him you know what kind of stuff are you into and I, he said oh I like really terrible sounding black metal like Vlad Tepes and Mutilation and then uh, I, I asked him you know which of these is, is your favorite and he pulled out an Iljarn CD I already knew Iljarn at the time uh, do you remember I brought the Sort Vachter CD to your mm-hmm. house in Richmond. We thought it was total shit back then, but mm-hmm. we both agree now that it's genius. So yeah, I knew that I had found somebody of the same wavelength when I found John Gossard. So from there, he introduced me to some other people. I would you know hang out with them once in a while. Um, he would organize- Gossard was your conduit for the whole, like you met like Tomas Stench? No, or- Tomas came separately. So Tomas, Tomas was not part of that that group of people, but he eventually ended up hanging out as well. Um, yeah, so I don't remember how I met Tomas. I think I heard Mobile Ciudad, um, the self-title on CD first because somebody gave it to me or maybe I bought it at Rasputin's or Amoeba. I don't oh, remember. That cover, that cover art on the first Mobile Yeah, it was fucking uh one of the worst looking things ever but somebody at some point told me to check this out because they're from the bay area and it was actually good you know grinding black metal and i was like grinding black metal nobody's doing grinding like you know what people call war metal or bestial black metal you know blasphemy style black metal so i got the cd and i was i was pretty blown away it was like bass heavy and kind of clunky you know really terrible production uh, everything that I liked in black metal. Um, so I, I don't remember how I got in touch with Tomas. Maybe his address is, was inside the booklet or something. I, I found him and I asked him if I could do the vinyl because at the time I had already done the live ritual. I think I gave him a copy of the live ritual record. Uh, he was already a big blasphemy fan back then. Um, I think first time I met him, uh, he was wearing a Sorath t-shirt, pre-black funeral Sorath, so super deep underground, you know, so I knew that I had found another person of the same wavelength. Um, so yeah, we agreed to do the record. We did it. It was very successful. I got him in touch with uh, Vomit Priest. Um, he was a, He was an artist that was coming up in the scene. And Vomit Priest drew the mobile Sudet logo that everyone sees now. Uh, before that, they were using this very cleaned up logo that didn't really fit their style. Um, mm-hmm. 
it was actually designed by somebody fairly uh, grounded in underground metal in the early 90s. He used to run Quartz Records, if you know the Zemio 7-inch, uh, Absu 7-inch, that was all Torch, Torch Records, uh, split with Gothic Records. So I forgot his name now. I'm drawing a blank. My memory is going. But yeah, he he did that logo for Mobile Ciudad. And if you look at that logo very closely, that squiggly thing on, underneath the Mobile Ciudad logo, that thing appears on the Zemio 7-inch layout. So he just recycled some elements from his layout notebook or something. He must have had a clip. You know, it wasn't like a click, click, uh, clip notebook. It was, um, they had, they used to have these like art, art books that had a bunch of clip art inside of them. So I think he had something like that, you know. Well, actually, that, that reminds me, like, one of the things I, I've always liked, one of the stories I've liked is the method you use to create the, the, I mean, we talked about how shitty the original Mobile Sudad cover looked and, obviously what people remember now is the one that you designed how did you design that oh yeah yeah <laughs> so um that came from an old flyer that mobile sudad had so they played a gig i don't remember at all what the gig was but they had a was, gig flyer a bunch of bands it was a bunch of bands from mexico i think yeah and yeah it was mostly mexican yeah, bands crazy. and they played in la i believe and it was like uh it was just an old flyer from the nineties that they had. They, you know, Xeroxed it for me. And I liked this one small element of the border. Um, it was a goat's head with some stuff coming out of it. So I ended up just taking that goat's head, kind of Xeroxing out the elements that I didn't want using white out. You know, this wasn't, this was pre Photoshop for me. So I to did be it clear, all that, that image is like an inch tall on the flyer. Right, yeah, on the flyer, so, it was the an border inch tall. image. Right. And you blew it up and made it into this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. It had like an inverted cross as part of it that was, that kind of looked like uh, Carrie King's shitty tribal tattoo. So I removed that and just concentrated on the goat's head, which I thought was really cool and iconic looking. So to this day, that's kind of like their Bathory goat's head. You know, they, they put it mm -hmm. on shirts and they have other artwork kind of um, based on that goat's head. I, yeah, so in terms of the cover design, I, you know, I went for the classic, um, you know, black, white, red. I had probably Bathory in mind at the time and Sodom. If you look at the back cover, it's very much inspired by Sodom with the, you know, artwork. Um, sorry, not the artwork, but the band photos kind of superimposed on top of each other um, randomly. That was... That I took that from Sodom and uh, the inverted crosses that were slightly slanted. Uh, I have some more questions I want to ask, but th this I'm going to jump ahead because what you just said made me think of something that I want to talk to you about is given the the state of metal imagery and aesthetics at the time you you were really getting your label off the ground. How did you know you tried you had a different vision and that's always been something that people have associated with NWN. Like what what did you see as your um that was different about your approach to designing records and what you wanted metal to look like at the time? Yeah, um I didn't really have any grand scheme. I just had personal taste for old school layouts that were reminiscent of the 80s designs no use of photoshop um and if you remember in the late 90s a bunch of labels were creating the most atrocious looking atrocious looking album covers uh the one that comes to mind the most is invasion records i think they were out of germany or something it was just like a photoshop uh layer diarrhea it was just whatever they found in the lowest resolution blurred the shit and uh 3d effects added and it just looked like uh yeah i mean the, the best way to describe it is photoshop diarrhea they were terrible and that was basically the um like the highlight you know that was basically what bigger labels were also doing at the time uh, you know if you look at like uh children of bodom's cover or um some incantation layouts from that time period you'll see a lot of really terrible photoshop collage designs you know um, so that, that was like, 
that was exactly i knew what i didn't like that was it you know i still don't like stuff like that to this day i i really dislike photoshop in general i just see it as a tool i wish they hadn't added all these uh filters that people use I, it just ruins layouts for me whenever i see drop shadows i i try not to use them i think it's okay for web design but for print drop shadows are like cancer it just ruins the layout for me so yeah i mean i had this i had it in my head that i didn't like that type of layout this photoshop diarrhea layout I liked very stark, no fuzziness. And if, if the fuzziness was introduced, it had to be from um, from like analog sources, like a spray can or can, uh, yes, spray paint or uh, airbrush or something. Kind of like um, Morbid Visions cover that was all airbrushed. So I accept that kind of fuzziness, but when it comes to uh, digital fuzziness, it always looked artificial to me. So I hated that stuff. I knew what I liked. I knew what I didn't like. And that's how I created my layouts. And I don't I don't claim that I had the most perfect layouts back then. We made plenty of mistakes. Some of some of the mistakes were mine. Some of the mistakes were made by the graphic designer at the time. Um, but we were trying to create an image that um fit the band and were old school. So I, I think it's it's become pretty normal these days to go for a more standard clean layout like that. I see people still doing some Photoshop diarrheas, but it's not, it's kind of, it's, it's fallen out of uh, fashion these days. Um, mm -hmm. I see a lot more uh, digital art though. That's, that's a different thing entirely. Like people painting entire covers in some sort of a program and you can usually tell when you start looking at it very closely. And I, I really dislike that. Um, and uh, the next step is probably AI generated art. I've already seen that happen before. So that's a terrible trend in visual art, in my opinion. And, you know, while metal art tends to be lowbrow, I still like to think that there's some aesthetic value to metal art. Um, and if it goes in the way of AI art, I, that's going to be the death of visual art for me, at least. Well, what about when AI art, music or visual art is basically as good or better? What, what about when you can you can tell, you know, AI, like, uh, make me a new Blasphemy album, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. And, like it, and it generates pretty much a perfect clone. Uh, it generates a, a proclamation record. <laughs> it generates yeah. a a clone of blasphemy that you can listen to on your own. You can, you, you can say, Oh, I want it to have this type of song or these types of riffs or something. And that will, I mean, what, what about that? When, when you can, is that, what's your opinion on, on that potential for the future? Yeah. I mean, it's a very scary future that we're heading straight into probably pretty soon in the next decade, we're going to see a future that's almost unrecognizable in terms of technological leaps. And I feel like there is going to be spiritual bankruptcy happening pretty soon as humans are removed from the formula. And this is, you know, we're getting into some deep philosophical and spiritual realm that I'm not fully, um, I haven't really articulated this. And I'm not sure how I feel about it. Um, on one hand, if you can't tell the difference between human generated art and AI generated art, what really is at stake? Um, I think what's at stake is right now we can still kind of tell who generated what, right? Once that line blurs, then what's the role of humans in this civilization? And just because AI creates something very similar, does it mean that um, it's still the same thing? I don't know. I can't answer that. You know, is it the same thing? Is it going to still have the same effect? Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't really understand uh, what we're doing. I think humans are making some major mistakes right now, and I wish we could course correct, but it's probably too late. Yeah, I think. I think. A lot of people, including myself, have been caught off guard by the realization that this new technology is likely to 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 
you know, supplant human creativity and, and other forms of certain, uh, you know, human intellectual work mm -hmm. rather I, you know, for so long, I think most people believe that this new technology would, you know, take over sort of menial tasks and, and that sort of thing. But now we're seeing, yeah, I mean, if you can, if you can generate, if AI can generate an album that sounds better than what, you know, the, an artist that you like is generating, it kind of begs the question, well, why would you need the artist then? Um, I, I mean, personally, I, I, it, it terrifies me personally. I think it's, it's, you know, repugnant, but mm -hmm. my, you know, but I, I can foresee that as a possible future, a very likely future. Yeah. I mean, it's very likely. And I think you touched on a very good, good point in that if, if the artist's job is then to just tell AI to draw something, will we lose the the skill set entirely over time? Kind of like handwriting is going away as we just type everything on the computer or just voice type. You know, I, I've started doing that, and it's much easier. You know, I, I've always sucked at typing on my phone. I can just talk to the phone, and um, you know, it makes mistakes, but most of the time it works just fine. So we might get to the point where drawing some, you know, something very simple becomes kind of like handwriting is today where most people just can't do it. People just have really terrible handwriting or cursive, you know, I don't mm -hmm. even think my kid knows mm -hmm. how to write cursive. I don't think they're teaching that in school anymore. And I hardly remember myself. <laughs> I haven't, I don't remember the last time I wrote in cursive. I can't do it anymore. I was I was trying a while back. I can't do it. Yeah. Or maybe I going could, but it would take me forever. <laughs> going back to the uh you know, your time in the Bay Area and the bands you were working with. Um, you know, you mentioned Asunder, Morbosdad, but I, I know there's also Vaughn, Bonal, Black Goat. Mm -hmm. Um uh Vaughn, there's a what was the story behind that? Because that that was right. one of the releases that really started to to draw a lot more attention to you and established you know nwn as like a, a you know a real you know sort of up and coming label right so vaughn was already notorious back then in the 90s because if you remember varg wore that vaughn t-shirt in court and talked about vaughn fondly so people had this uh, misconception that Vaughn was some sort of a right wing band because of that. Um, so they had this weird uh, imagery around them that had nothing to do with the band. Uh, but a lot of people were interested in it. And then when the demo got bootlegged by uh, Black Moon from Dark Funeral, that's when it became more widely, widely uh, known. And I think I I think I knew about Vaughn, but I hadn't heard them yet. It was some, something like that. And so when I first heard it through the bootleg CD, I was completely blown away. I mean, to this day, it's some of the best recordings ever, right? It's completely minimalist and stripped down. And the vocals are reduced to just chants. Um, it's very innovative. I don't even know what the references were back then when it was recorded. And there was this like... It was completely mysterious because they didn't really go on to form other bands. Um, Joe Kill went on to, to join Autopsy and Abscess, and that's how I actually tracked them down. Um, back then, emails weren't a thing yet, so I, I was reading, or well, not reading, but writing uh, letters to people. That's how I got in touch with uh, Chris Weifert. That's how I got in touch with uh, Joe from Goat Lord. Um, and countless other people, you know, not everyone was doing emails back then. Um, so yeah, I got in touch with Chris Reifert because um, I knew that he knew somebody from Vaughn. I didn't know who at the time. I wrote him. He said, oh yeah, Joe uh, plays an abscess with me right now. So he gave me Joe's snail mail address. I wrote to him. Um, I proposed this like release for Vaughn that was official. So we met at a steakhouse or something and I remember us talking um, in, I think it was in Livermore or uh, somewhere over there. Um, and uh, we came up with a deal 
And that's how things happen with Vaughn. You know, luckily for me, he had other tapes for for Vaughn. So it wasn't just Satanic Blood. He also had Blood Angel demo. And there was one other demo called Anger Session that never got released because it sounded slightly different. It was with a different drummer. So he asked me not to release it back then. But that was also a Vaughn project. It was it was a uh, goat and kill and uh, a different drummer who was not as fast. The drummer ended up moving to Hawaii and becoming a like a Buddhist yoga person. So he, he didn't want anything to do with black metal anymore. And goat came back into the scene sort of later on. Yeah. He did the Vaughn goat record. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And then it's also featured John Gossard and uh and uh Brandon Serrano from Bone All and not uh, John Gossard, he didn't play on that. It was uh Jeff he recorded or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Gossard recorded it for us, mm -hmm. mastered it for us, and um yeah, but yeah, so that was kind of an all-star lineup, I guess. Mm -hmm. It was a commercial flop, you know, it was it face planted. Um, but it yeah. had a lot to do with the the what was going on with that other member who wasn't originally in the band. I mean, Vaughn just, you know, it's yeah, like, it was a really messy situation yeah. back then with, you know, other members who didn't play on the recording coming in and sort of uh, hijacking the name or whatever the case, I don't remember what the situation was, but a lot of messiness happened with Vaughn that, um, that was not, you know, it didn't paint the band in a good light. Uh, so yeah. It is what it is, but that was a that was an experiment in creating a boy band. You know, we had we had Brandon, we had Jeff Whitehead, we had John Gossard involved, and Goat from Vaughn. It, it could have turned out to be something better, maybe, but it is what it is. I still like the recording. It's it's not bad. It just didn't do well commercially. Yeah. Um. So the Bay Area, you know, you lived here, I forget how many years, but it, it, after a while, like the scene seemed to sort of you know, disintegrate, uh, you know, more Bolsadab moved away, mm -hmm. you know, Sunder stopped playing, um, you know, the bands that, that you know, were sort of in uh, your orbit or, or you know, at the time had all kind of gone yeah. on to other things. And, and you recently chose to move to Austin. Mm -hmm. um what uh, you know other than the the kind of the you know basic issues related to to running a business that's better in texas and you know the the restrictions on life that were imposed here in california during the pandemic you know what what led you to move there and what's the experience been like for you and for the label since you arrived yeah so I'll address the first part about the Bay Area and the scene kind of changing over time. It wasn't like the scene went away. The scene is still there. You know, it just evolved into something different. And the scene that I was in, more involved in where, you know, Asunder was very active, Mobile Sida was very active, Bonal was very active, all that sort of started to change as we got older and people started to move away. Um, I think at the time, uh my first kid was born it was 2008 um things were already changing i was i moved from um pacifica over to oakland um i think john was also moving from san francisco to oakland somewhere um the bono guys were always in the marin area but yeah i mean and then tomas from mobile said i moved away to texas around that time i think so things were in flux and the scene wasn't the same that I remembered in the early 2000s. Um, so yeah, in, you know, fast forward to 2021, the scene was completely different. Um, the bands that I really liked had either moved away or broken up by then and you know, people kind of drifted apart and uh, there wasn't that much of a metal scene to speak of that I liked. There were, there were some death metal bands coming up. I'm not, I like death metal, but I like old death metal, you know. I wasn't so much into the new crop of death metal bands that were coming up. They're more, um, they were kind of more associated with the punk scene as well. And they were, 
uh, experimenting with some politics that I didn't really care for. So I think a lot of things were happening in the Bay Area that I didn't, I didn't really like. And when the chance came up after the pandemic or during the pandemic to move away, um, because I was working for a biotech company where I was going into the office every day uh, up until the pandemic hit. And when pandemic hit, it was kind of like a blessing in disguise. Everyone had to work from home and that became the norm um, for almost the entire white collar industry, right? Almost everyone just worked from home. And unfortunately, blue collar people still had to go into work which is really screwed up, or they just had to stay home and not get a paycheck, which was also messed up. But luckily I was able to work from home. And at some point I realized if I'm just doing this from Oakland, I could do this from anywhere, you know, work for a big company somewhere else. So I asked my boss and uh, he said, okay, you can work from wherever you want to move to. And I told him I want to move to Texas. He was all for it because he, he's in, he's stationed in uh, Houston. So the fact that I would be moving to Austin kind of made it okay for him because we would be in the same time zone. Um, so yeah, so that that was uh, one of the main reasons for deciding to move. Just the fact that I could take my job with me because I still had to pay for stuff, right? Um, I think it was uh, October of 2020 when I told you. Um, and I think I came out and told the, you know, told everyone on my message board and, and it just kind of went from there. Once I decide to do something and I announce it to the world, I usually follow through with it. That's always been my thing is I stick to my word. Whenever I create a new project, I stick to it and, and go all the way to the end. So I treated it just like any other big project, just like when I bought the warehouse in Oakland this would be another one of these big projects. And I planned it out very meticulously from when I would go there, where I would stay, all this stuff kind of um, came to realization very slowly, but piece by piece, I made it work. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, looking back on it, it's probably the craziest logistical organization that I've ever done. It was like 50 something pallets worth of junk. And I had a window of like two days, you know, I, the, the last pallet got picked up. And then the day after that, I was on the plane to Austin and, you know, I was living out of a hotel for a week with my wife and, uh, the warehouse wasn't ready yet. We had to get all the pallets we so the next day after after arriving the next day the pallets started to arrive at the warehouse and uh because part of the thing was not every pallet could be picked up in one day because that would have made things easier you know everything got picked up in one day and then you know because it takes about three or four days for the trucks to go from oakland to texas by um uh, by driving because they have to stop every certain number of hours. Trucker truckers can't drive for you know longer than a certain number of hours, so they have to stop and sleep. So it takes about three or four days from Oakland to Texas. But since we had to stagger it across multiple days, that meant that on the last day, the first truck was very you know on the first or the, on the last day that the truck was picking up the last pallet the first truck was already very close <laughs> to Austin, Texas. So then I had to fly to Austin to hurry up and receive the first batch of pallets. So it was just a logistical, you know, super move. I, I can't believe that I still pulled it off. Thanks to uh, Cody and Alex for helping us out. Um, unfortunately, Cody couldn't, you know, stay with us, just didn't work out, but Alex is still with us and he's Alex Alex is uh he lived here and started working for you here in the uh in yeah. Oakland and then moved with you to Texas and is still Yeah, you actually found Alex working at Whole Foods near you <laughs> and you asked him if he wanted to volunteer for NWN so he did that for several years just volunteering his time and just taking records and as pay 
And then he, I hired him as an hourly worker, a couple hours per week. And then after moving to Austin, I hired him full time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Alex has been with me for, I don't know, I can't even remember, maybe close to eight years or nine years at this point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's basically NWN um, employee number two. I'm number one. He's number two. And then Justin came on board a um, little over a year ago and he's He's working full time as well. So, so looking out, I wanted to sort of go over some of the the aspects of of NWN that have been noteworthy <clears throat> over time. And you you mentioned one earlier, but the the diehard releases, and we talked about this a little bit last time. But that's that's sort of uh, one of the things that people initially in the first you know decade of of the label really associated with what you were doing mm -hmm. and um and and, and and at least early on the diehards always had some handmade component to them and that you, they they were much more diy mm -hmm. oriented um what just why was it that you started doing that and what um what after a while it sort of say it became something that people would criticize you for uh, like oh it's another diehard edition we don't need one of those who needs a patch and sticker or something you know like what how, just i guess tell me what you your feelings are looking back now and you you do them occasionally now but it's it's not like a trademark anymore um what is yeah. it that how do you feel about that uh as part of your label's legacy um so I'm a true believer in creating some sort of identity for any project. So with NWN, I wanted to do something different from others. I took cues from the noise industrial scene. You know, I was always a surface skimmer with that kind of music. You were more involved in it. Um, and those labels were always doing some sort of weird, elaborate, handmade thing. So I got that idea from, you know, the noise industrial scene, but the idea of a limited edition, you know, version of the same title came from Iron Pegasus. So they, they were already doing the diehard picture discs or diehard color, color vinyl back then. If you look at old Iron Pegasus titles, like, um, like the early Sabbath records, they had stickers on the front that said Die Hard Picture Disc or something. So that's where the Die Hard idea came from. Obviously, they probably took it from Venom Die Hard. Um, but yeah, the that idea came originally from Iron Pegasus. So thank you, Co Costa, for inspiring me. Um, to this day, Iron Pegasus remains one of the best labels out there. One of my favorites. Always doing great music. Um, so yeah. The Die Hard thing, you know, at the beginning, I'm a record collector, so I wanted to have a record that I wanted for myself. And the ones that I always liked were the the crazy limited edition stuff. Um, you know, the tour editions where the center labels left blank because they didn't have enough time to uh, make them, you know, press all of them with the proper center labels. Maybe the layouts were not ready, so they just Xeroxed the covers and they made special tour editions and they hand stamped the center labels with different things. And those were always stuff that I was looking for for my own collection. So when I started the label, I had the opportunity to just create the version that I wanted. Um, so that's where the Die Hard thing came about. I wanted to create a record that I, you know, that I could just keep in my collection and others would also have the same sort of experience. They get to keep something that was a little bit more personal. And um, I like the idea of just like touching every copy that went out, especially with the Die Hard edition. Um, yeah, some of those early ones were very DIY. Uh, it was, I had a little bit more time back then. You know, I was only doing a record every two to three months. So I could do more hands-on stuff like the Witches Hammer 7-inch where the cover was uh, hand embossed. So I remember I went to, a, you know, one of these like soccer mom stores where they have knickknacks and uh, handicrafts. Uh, it it might have been even Michael's or something like that. And I got one of those uh, 
I, I had a rubber stamp made locally in Berkeley. I think the rubber stamp store is still on Telegraph somewhere. I still have that rubber stamp from when I did the Witch's Hammer tape. Oh, right. Yeah. And I gave it to you. Yeah. Yeah. So that rubber stamp was made. I, I remember, um, I remember, I think it was Brandon from Bono. He helped me make that rubber stamp because he had, he had gotten something made at that same store. So he got that stamp for me. Uh, so yeah, it was like, uh, I don't even know what that printing method is called, but what you do is you rubber stamp the sticky substance and then you sprinkle some sort of powder, some plastic powder, and then you hit it with a heat gun and it melts, um, melts the plastic that's left on the paper. So yeah, you, you, you put the, uh, the plastic dusty stuff on it, you dust it off and then you melt the plastic onto the paper and that's how you get that you know that 3d effect it's usually used for stuff like uh, business cards you often see business cards with the raised letters that's how it's done so i use that same so-called technology it was very low low tech because <laughs> you have to do one at a time i remember that uh, i think witches hammer seven inch had 200 diehard copies and it took me solid eight hours to do all 200 because it was a very tedious task. Um, the envelopes themselves were Xeroxed, Xeroxed or laser printed, I don't remember, at my work. So I, I took the envelopes to work, resized the, the paper holder, their little, you know, little mechanisms inside where you can change uh how the m or how the paper is printed it took me like i don't know many tries to get it just right so that the artwork would get printed in the middle and then uh yeah and i took that home and then spent eight hours stamping and melting the ink so yeah that that was one of the most labor intensive releases you know just by looking at it, it doesn't look like it was that labor intensive but it was <laughs> Uh, well, so as as the label grew, you know, it's you stopped doing as many of these DIY projects, and it started to become sort of formulaic. You know, colored vinyl patch sticker, colored vinyl patch sticker, mm -hmm. and that's when there started to also be more criticism, like, oh, why why does everything have a diehard? Um, what? Why did you continue going on with it even after it? it, it once it um, because it, the, the mission statement was always the same. I wanted a record, some limited edition thing that I wanted to keep in my collection. And I never listened to criticisms. You know, the the people, these like beta male types that always criticize people doing stuff, they usually don't do anything themselves. So I don't listen to them. Just just this life lesson from me. Don't listen to people of lower status than you are. Always listen to people above you. So if somebody I, that I look look up to, you know, let's say Ryan Forster gives me a constructive criticism, obviously I'm going to listen. If you came to me and said, you know, you might want to reconsider this, I will listen. But if some beta male on a message board or some anonymous person on Instagram criticizes me and they haven't accomplished anything in life, obviously I'm not going to listen to that person. So uh maybe it was my stubbornness as well just like once i get into the groove of doing things um i tend to do them for a very long time uh maybe i'm like i have some level of autism or asperger's that forces me to do stuff like that i don't know but i like i like these limited edition records so that's why i kept on doing them I stopped doing them because of what you said. It was formulaic. It was becoming like a thing that I just did. And at that point, I was like, well, maybe I should just do it for certain releases. And that's what's happening now. I only do it for certain release releases that probably necessitates it. You know, if if a band gives me extra music, that's usually the trigger. So just recently, I did Cat uh, 666 as a triple LP with seven inch because the band provided me not only the 666 record, but the metal and how, and then the alternate mix for 666 and then the Ostani Taber seven inch, I'm sure I'm butchering Polish. Um, so yeah, that, that, that really necessitated a diehard version. Um, and then just recently I did the fingernail self-titled 
they gave me four bonus tracks that might have fit on the 12 inch, but it would have been compromising the audio quality. So I chose not to put it on the 12 inch and I did an extra seven inch and I added a um, patch and sticker to that. So yeah, I only do it when it's a little bit more um, special. So if there's extra music, then I usually do it. So the next Die Hard version is gonna be the Graveside 12 inch from Russia. It's part of the uh, Eastern Bloc Obscurity series. That one, they gave me an extra song again. It didn't fit on the record. It just, it just made it too long. So I put it on a cassette tape this time instead of a seven inch because it was only one song. And um, that's gonna be the next Die Hard version. Um, as far as doing something more DIY and hands-on, that's more of a time issue these days, but I plan on doing more of that when Helios is online because um, I can do more micro releases that are, um, you know, more DIY. So I can, the fact that the records will be pressed by my hands already makes it more DIY. Um, and I'm planning on doing more, more uh, I don't know, more elaborate or more creative packaging once Helios is up and running. I was also, you know, I, I talked to you about it last year. I, I've been toying around with the idea of doing a subscription subscription model for NWN. Um, so I'll, I'll, I think I'll start that once Helios is done and we're pumping out records because that makes more sense. I can, I can do more uh, micro presses and specialty colors and whatever I really want uh, once the factory is up and running. So subscription model that will probably involve some DIY packaging. I want to do more, you know, silk screen on fabric type stuff that I used to do. Um, you remember the uh, the sarcophagal test press sleeve or the bone all die hard stuff like that, I think is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, the, the Helios pre-order LPs will be kind of DIY um, in a way because the jackets are going to be printed on sheet metal. And um, I'll be hand numbering those and assigning names to the contributors. And just to be clear, even the stuff, I mean, you know, it may not be DIY in the traditional sense anymore, but you have direct involvement with everything that comes out on your label, even to this day, right? Right. Yeah. Physically, I might not be putting them together, but I'm involved in every single release um it's not like i just hand it off to the production manager there's no such thing here it's just uh it's just me uh alex and justin working in the warehouse and um you work with who dan freed for uh graphic yeah. design a lot of times yeah dan is my go-to graphic designer um sometimes justin stubbs from father be found shout out to justin he's an old time friend um he helps out sometimes Anik from Kachimar sometimes helps out. Um, and then in the past, Timo Ketola, who is um, who has passed away sadly, used to help out with graphic design um, but, and also just artwork in general. But yeah. Um, can we pause for just a couple of minutes? I need to get some more coffee. I have a few more questions uh, we can go over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Take a quick I think break. I can pause the recording. Let me see. Okay, so um, you we were just talking about how your label became associated with the diehard phenomenon, something a lot of other labels started to do as well, which invited a lot of criticism. Another thing that you know that came up early on in the label's history was that you started off kind of focusing on bestial black death metal and people pigeonholed you for a while as being a label that focused on that. Yeah. And especially as that genre exploded, partly because you sort of resurrected it to some degree. Yeah. Um, then that became another thing where people often said, oh, NWN is just a bestial black death metal label, even though you've done all kinds of other releases within the extreme metal underground. Um, yeah. What do you, you know, what do you think of that genre of music and how it shaped the label as, as the label grew? Yeah. I mean, I, 
obviously I like that style of music. And to this day, I release a lot of bestial black metal. So just recently we did Nuclear Hammer, Ixen, Profane Order. And um, yeah, and I'll continue to repress the classics from the genre like Black Witchery, Blasphemy. Um, and uh, yeah, there's so many more. Um, and I'll be doing more in the future, like the upcoming Diocletian album is in that style. But like you said, it's kind of like at this point, half and half, maybe half extreme black metal, bestial black metal, and half thrash and heavy metal. Um, I guess my taste in music also evolved over time to where now I appreciate all different types of music. Um, as, as a young 20 something year old, I was more into extreme metal, but I, I think both of, both of us are listening to more heavy metal than extreme metal these days. Maybe it's just some old man metal. I don't know. But, you know, in a normal day, I'm listening to Judas Priest a lot, especially the 70s albums, um, except the first album, you know, stuff like that, Motorhead. And then, um, and then also the heavy metal albums that I'm usually working on. So as part of the Eastern Bloc Obscurities I've done, you know, Magnet, uh, two Magnet records, Credo, Bar Bar. Um, and I'll continue to do more uh, Eastern European heavy metal and thrash death metal. So, yeah, I think it's just, uh, I don't know about the pigeonholing thing. I think it's mostly from people who just don't follow NWN and they just focus on the bigger stuff that I've done, like Blasphemy, Beherit, stuff like that, um, Black Witchery. Most people who follow the label semi-closely can understand that my taste is very eclectic. I'm all over the map in terms of at least the metal genre. You know, I don't really release too much punk or hardcore. I did that one Citizens Arrest record, but that's that was a one oddball, you know. Besides that wasn't that, on NWN, right? There was no, it was just on a subsidiary. I didn't put it on NWM, but that was, uh, and you know, that's that's a record that I pressed. Um, we did it on a just a made up record label called Old Hardcore Records, taking cues from King Fowley's old old metal records. Um, so another feature that I think led to the growth of NWN at a pivotal moment was the the when you started hosting a message board on your website um what led you to do that and how did that impact the label and then what led you to shut it down which is another source of criticism you received at the time yeah um the message board is something that kind of came about organically as um the full moon production message board was closing down um full moon productions closed down sort of uh, I think it was in the early 2000s and then there was no place to go. Um, back then, you know, social media wasn't a thing. The social, only social media that existed were message boards. So I went on to the Full Moon Productions message board pretty early on and I met a lot of people there. Discussions back then were, you know, half kind of retarded and half very serious and underground. So it was pretty entertaining. So we created this message board kind of just to mirror the Full Moon Productions message board because it was going away. That went on for many years. Um, and in 20, I think it was 2019 or 2018, or was it 2020? I don't remember. Um, I was getting shit from Antifa and there was a lot of pressure. So... I just didn't feel like dealing with it at that point. It was just a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I felt like I was pushing a boulder up a hill for other people and it just didn't, wasn't worth it for a message board that was kind of an outdated format to begin with. You know, most people were on social media anyway. It was cool while it lasted. Um, you know, I could bring it up any bring it back, but I just don't have the time anyway. So moderating a message board is a lot of work. You have to make sure that 
people aren't being ripoffs or trolls. We try to weed those out as much as possible. So the administrative task of just having a message board wasn't something I wanted to have. And the the political correctness police were just coming after me. Um, so unfortunately, it just it just it was something that I didn't feel like dealing with anymore. Do you think that the period of time that you were operating the message board um, was, I mean, that was a big period of growth for NWN. Do you think that had a lot to do with just the increased traffic to your site and that sort of thing? It's hard to say um, because business practices have changed over time as well. So while that was a good growth period, I met some people and discovered some bands on the message board. I think NWN is actually bigger now than it was when when that was going on. So I don't know who's to say what actually triggered the growth. Was it the message board or was it my change in business tactics or the bands I'm working with now? Um, whatever the case, NWN is going stronger now than it it did when the message board was around. And I guess the, the last um, piece of it that I think something that really has grown to define your work with the label is the fest that you started to do with uh, Patrick from Iron Bonehead. Um, I forget what year the first fest was, but it was originally an NWA. 2009. Fest. It was 2009, 2009 okay. yeah. And at the time, I'm not aware of any, I mean, there maybe there were, but I'm not aware of any underground metal labels that had a fest that was associated with a particular label. Um, that was something that you and Patrick started, I think. And then now it's evolved into the Never Surrender Fest, which mm -hmm. is you know, a showcase for NWN and Iron Bonehead. Um, yeah. How did that idea come about? And and what, uh, you know, why do you consider that something you'll that will be ongoing indefinitely? Or is that is it something you enjoy doing? Yeah, so I met Patrick. Kramer from Iron Bonehead online many years ago. I mean, he's been operating Iron Bonehead for much longer than I've been operating NWN. But, you know, at the beginning of Iron Bonehead was smaller. But his label goes all the way back to the 90s when he was doing some tapes for Mayhemic Truth and so on. Um, and his roots in, in the underground go even deeper when he was in the, you know, Nima, his black metal project going all the way back to the mid 90s. So he's been active in the black metal underground for much longer than I have. You know, Nima had a split with Moonblood of all bands. So that, you know, his underground credentials are very solid. So when I met him in person in 2008, um, I don't remember who set it up. It might have been him, but there was a gig in Berlin. It was Bestial Raids. Um, Necros Christos Proclamation. I don't remember if a uh, Blasphemophasia played, but it was a lot of NWN bands and associates and friends. So I ended up flying out there and attending the gig. I met Patrick. We hung out. Um, we hatched this idea of doing an NWN fest. At the time, NWN was much bigger than Iron Bonehead. Iron Bonehead is pretty much um, at, at one point, I think Iron Bone had, it had eclipsed NWN and when it was bigger than, than NWN. I, at this point, I think we're pretty much about the same size. Um, this is when like he was doing Bold, uh, Bolzer and other bigger bands. So it had a huge growth uh, right around 2009, 2010, 2011. He really focused on running the label on distro. Um, in fact, I learned a lot from uh, Patrick's, um, you know, business tactics of just concentrating on the distro, just having the stuff that people want, um, you know. So, yeah. So I met I met him in 2000, 2008 at the gig. We hatched the idea of doing the NWN Fest. We did the first one in two thousand nine which was a very good fest. You were there. Uh, we had an all-star lineup. Uh, Bono played. Uh, Midnight played their first gig outside the U.S. So that was pretty monumental. Um, 
They built the, the stage or something. What happened? There was like some problem with the midnight smash the base or something. Oh yeah, yeah. That also turned out to be the impetus for midnight leaving NWN because they had smashed their base in you know Chronos fashion on stage, and they ended up breaking the stage itself. And you know these bigger venues are tight asses. If you destroy something, they make you pay for them. So you know. It wasn't something that was planned because if it was planned, then we would have put some concrete block or something, which we ended up doing for Sabbath later on. So if you watch the you know live Sabbath videos from uh, any of my NWN fest, you'll see me run out before gives all smashes base with the concrete block. I think we've done that now twice. So that wasn't pre-planned, and so I ended up asking Jamie to partially fund the replacement and uh and he was pretty pissed about that at the time and, you know in hindsight it wasn't such a great business move on my part i should have just eaten the 500 bucks or whatever you know cost it was but back then i was just operating like you know it was just like hand to mouth type of operation where every every little penny counted and 2009 fest the very first nwn fest was a financial disaster of a different magnitude it was like twenty thousand dollars that we lost we were very um optimistic and we booked a bunch of international bands um we learned a lot from our mistakes in the 2009 fest but true to our you know never surrender ethics we didn't quit we came back in 2010 and did a different one we slimmed down the the lineup a bit made it stronger in fact i think the 2010 lineup was the strongest lineup we did right because we had blasphemy mystifier mystifier played their first gig mm -hmm. outside of brazil i think that was their very first gig nwn fest 2 2010 um we had order from chaos mm -hmm. uh shibolba played their very first gig there on the outside of mexico um who else do we have i think dead congregation proclamation mono were you know playing almost every single fest at the beginning yeah i think the aforementioned von goat played oh yeah von goat actually played that was kind of a disaster but i remember <laughs> Brandon was like deathly sick on stage and it was he was sweating profusely. <laughs> yeah. He he I think he barely made it through that. the fact that he was like about to vomit on stage or shit himself on stage. It was a very bad, it wasn't a very good performance just because it was kind of a studio project. It wasn't meant to be a live band. Um, you know, but it is what it is. It was still a very killer fest. Um it was probably the strongest lineup that we've done, you know. Just the fact that we had Blasphemy, Mystifier, and Order from Chaos on the same bill is kind of mind blowing in hindsight. What are some other memorable uh, fest moments that you're you can recall now? Um, at the 2009 fest, the very first one, I remember Chris Volcano uh, had a group of us just sitting around in a circle, and he would. He would tell us these crazy stories about alien technology. He was a firm believer in That's alien it. technology, like some sort of, some sort of, um, I don't know, energy producing. <laughs> I don't. I can't even recall what he was saying, but it was, he was talking hundred percent seriously about some sort of alien technology, is what I recall, and he was completely sober. He was. It wasn't like he was completely drunk out of his ass. Um, 100% sober, 100% talking about alien technology. So that was that was very memorable from the first fest. Um, I think Lino and uh, some of you almost got into a fight at the Halford Bar. <laughs> Weren't you oh, well, there? Uh, I was there. Was a, that was Brandon. a few years later. There was a fight that I left before it happened. I don't even remember. Oh, I, I'm, some... Something always happens at the Halford Bar. So... Mm -hmm. Um, I think although that... fingernails, uh, uh, Angelo from fingernails played with, uh, oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, with so, yeah. At the first, yeah, I don't know why I, I waited so long to work with fingernails or you know, this this self titled album. 
was never reissued just until recently when I did it. I thought it was already done, so I didn't even think about doing it until, you know, I looked it up on Metal Archives and it hadn't been done. It was just endless CD uh, and tape editions, but no vinyl editions. So yeah, the my my history with fingernails goes all the way back to around. Did someone that. get an arm broken or something at one of the fests? Oh like... yeah, yeah, that was that was uh, that was uh, Vlad from Pseudo God versus Juan from Proclamation arm wrestling match. So if you see both of them side by side, they almost look about the same size. They were both doing uh, weightlifting, but. Juan was doing powerlifting, which is a different beast entirely. And he was competing Olympic, Olympics level. So he might have looked about the same size, but his strength was just crazy, he, especially back then. Um, I, don't, I think he's still lifting, but not professionally. So back then he was lifting professionally and competing. And sometimes you can't tell when somebody is stronger just based on their size. He was very muscular, uh, but he was just exponentially stronger than Vlad. So when they did this arm wrestling match, he ended up snapping his arm. And uh, the crazy thing is Vlad was such a crazy, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure his name is Vlad. I could be completely wrong. It was the main guy from Pseudo God. I'm sorry if uh, if that's not your name. <laughs> um, so he ended up breaking his arm, going to the hospital, getting like some you know some some makeshift arms uh swing thing and coming back to the fest for the for the next day <laughs> and he had an x-ray and it was complete i mean you could see in the x-ray that the bone was completely snapped in half so that was uh one of the craziest stories um when the guitars from holocausto like disappeared the night before the fest and came back and like yeah yeah something written on his forehead or yeah, no yeah, one knew where he's been yeah he uh i yeah i don't i don't remember which member but yeah it was the guitar player he left and he <clears throat> he disappeared he got shit face drunk and they found him passed out with something drawn some sort of political symbol that I won't mention here, drawn on his forehead. And uh, and I don't remember if that was before or after they played, but I'm before. pretty sure it was before. It, right? It was, it was before, before because, yeah, yeah because they, they were the headliner. They were, they <laughs> sounded awesome though. Like yeah, they it, still it, sounded yeah. perfectly fine. Yeah, they sounded yeah. awesome. So maybe that's a natural state of uh, being. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But I mean, yeah, there are many, many stories of just craziness that happened um, there was a bar fight that broke out with some of the blasphemy guys where it ended up in the street and this i wasn't there but the story goes that the, the black winds threw the guy onto the hood of an oncoming car and at the same time that that was happening the car the cop cars were pulling up so they had to jump into a taxi right away and speed away so they were like just you know, inches away from getting locked up. And that was before they played. So, you know, if they had gotten locked up, no blast for me and maybe a riot would have happened. I don't know. Yeah, it was, it was fucking insane. So many, yeah, so many great stories from the previous NWN Fest. We did a total of five of them in Berlin and then one, uh, one in uh, Tijuana. And you have, uh, one coming up soon in uh, Osaka that you're doing with uh, Dominic Fernal from Hospital. Right. I mean, that's called NWN Hospital Fest, but it's a different type of beast, you know, just, just in respect to Patrick and what he did for me in the Berlin Festival. It's not exactly the same thing because, it, you know, NWN Fest has always been about just NWN bands getting showcased. So the one we're doing in Osaka is a different beast entirely and different concept as well. We're, we were trying to mix two different underground scenes. And I think we managed to do that successfully. It hasn't happened yet. You know, it's coming up in April, but the lineup that we've gathered makes total sense because we have Beherit High, Beherit High headlining both nights. Um, you know, Beherit is famous for doing black metal as well as electronic music and and even like harsh noise later on and dark ambient. So it makes total sense that they would headline both nights. And there is some crossover appeal with bands like 
Masona and Genocide Oregon that a lot of metalheads are into. Um, and I think it goes the other way as well, you know, um, noise people and electronic music people tend to like stuff that I release. So I think it makes sense that there's this crossover appeal festival in Japan. Also, Departure Chandelier, you know, being uh, now affiliated with NWN. Right. Yeah, that was the bridge that happened first. You know, I was talking to Dom. He He's him and Pierre Mark are Departure Chandelier. So when we started talking, we were trying to build something completely different. Um, we started out with Blast for Me and Genocide Oregon as the backbone of the fest. And then once we got Beherit, uh, it became completely serious. We had to get it off the ground right away. So we were looking for venues in Tokyo. We couldn't find them. We looked into Osaka as a secondary place to do it. And luckily there was a brand new venue. We were able to book it and now it's about to happen in April. So we're really looking forward to that. And that was a lot of that was also done with the help of uh, Moenos from Sex Messiah, who's been, you know, she's a uh, you know, phenomenal musician. She's been really helping with doing a lot of the legwork for this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So she's been very helpful in many aspects. Um, over the years, we've uh, cultivated a very close working relationship with Moenos. So she has played uh, the Tijuana Festival as well as the San Marcos Festival as Sex Messiah. And she's helping us greatly with the Osaka Fest. And also she she does noise and, and industrial music on her own. So that kind of makes sense that she would right. help to facilitate this. Yeah, and she also knew Masona personally since he's from that area. Um, so as far as, uh, I mean, do you intend to, well, I, I guess going back to the, the Osaka Fest before we finish up, is there anything uh that that's you know uniquely special about setting something up in japan i mean you've worked with japanese bands like sabbat and evil uh right. anatomia you've had you know you've had a lot of relationships with japanese bands you're obviously you know you're, you're from japan um does it mean anything significant to you to set up a fest there i've always wanted to do it you know i i've been bugging naru-san from obliteration records for many years he does his festival, the Asakusa Death Fest, but I could never get buy-in from him or anyone else to really do one there. So it's always in my dream to do a festival in Japan, you know, my home country. While I'm more American than Japanese these days, I still consider Japan to be my home country. Um, so it, I've always wanted to do something there. I work with a lot of Japanese bands. Um, it was natural for me to set something up there. Uh, I don't know why it took this long to do it. You know, 24 years in, we're finally doing one. Um, but I think it's it was maybe worth the wait because this is this is the magnitude of this festival is pretty crazy. Very first Behera gig outside of Europe. You know, at the time of announcement, it was supposed to be the first gig outside of Finland. But since then, they played. Well, actually, they played in Finland just recently, so I don't know if it's if it's going to be the first one outside of Finland. Maybe they have one more gig outside of Finland before Osaka. Um, but the yeah, we, regardless, from their, the clips from their recent uh, performance were excellent. So I, I'm oh, yeah. very forward to it. Yeah, it, it's pretty crazy how close the sound was to the uh, the old performances, and they have two out of three original members playing. So you know. Sodomatic Slaughter is back on drums. Um, Holocausto obviously is doing effects and vocals and uh, they have new blood in the band. Um, one member who played on Engram, so I guess he's not still new blood. And um, Yuha from Witchcraft is now uh, in the band as well on guitar and vocals. I remember Witchcraft when they played at one of the fests, Sodomatic Slaughter actually Joined, oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. the hair cover right yeah they play gate of nana um mm -hmm. with sodomatic slaughter on on drums mm -hmm. yeah so they've been friends for a very long time witchcraft in a way is um 
is, I mean, I don't want to say a tribute band to Beherit, but it's essentially modeled after Beherit. It's kind of like the the band that took the mantle and, you know, and kept it going. Because Finland, if you think about it, Finland doesn't have that many bands that sound like Beherit or even Archgoat. You know, Archgoat sounds like Archgoat. It came back. Um but in terms of bands that sounded like Beherit or Barathrum, even Barathrum doesn't sound like that anymore, right? So it's basically just witchcraft, um, Rye for Revenge, and maybe just a couple of other bands that are playing in that style. You know, maybe Warfare Noise, but that's more on the grindy sound side of things, and that's probably closer to what uh, Gold Volva was doing uh, rather than Beherit. So yeah, there aren't too many bands from Beher, I mean not Beher, Finland playing in the Beherit style anymore. So Witchcraft is probably the biggest band right now playing in that style from Finland. So it makes sense they would be Yeah, you know, it, it, it would, makes to... total sense. And also Yuha is such a good musician when it comes to getting the nuances and essence of a band. So um I think he was the right person to take over some of the vocal duties for Beherit and some of the guitar duties. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and it's come up a, a few times indirectly throughout our conversation, but you know, there are certain relationships you've forged with people that have persisted throughout this, this yes. uh, the label. I mean, you know, Ryan Forster is one that, um, obviously has been very critical and it's it's professional and also a friendship that has uh lasted a long time chuck keller um uh you know tomas stench like what are some of the 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 people that you've known since the beginning or close to the beginning that have um you've re you've remained close with uh throughout the the history of the label thinking of gazal and Yasin. yeah um yeah, I, I think the only other person besides Ryan that uh, was at the very beginning, I mean, obviously you were there and you were an integral part of the label very, you know, at the very beginning, especially after you moved to the Bay Area. Um, you were helping me for many years unpaid. Um, this was at the very beginning when it was we just didn't have money at all, you know, we're just scraping by. Um, Besides Ryan, who continues to be one of my inspirations and just a very strong supporter of NWN and whatever I do, essentially, you know, he's supportive of Helios, uh, Jay Reed from Revenge as well. One of my inspirations for keeping this label going. Um, I spoke recently to Daniel from uh, Down With The Most High of Spain. He... Uh, you know, I was in touch with them all the way back to the sarcophagal picture this release when he contributed some images for me. He's in the thanks list for that release. So you know, there are maybe five or six people from the very beginning that, um, you know, continues to inspire me and continues to support the label and whatever I do. Chuck Keller is definitely one of them. You know, Chuck Keller is almost like, a religion for me at this point everything that he's actually created you know i can say um that my spiritual existence whatever that means owes a lot to order from chaos's lyrics and the concept of conqueror of fear in if i think back on it that's probably the first time that a band's concept really grabbed me besides when I was a teenager and, you know, this like straight edge stuff and like leftist politics really grabbed me in the metal scene, you know, who cares about Satanism? I was never uh, really into religion, Satanism or Christianity or any sort of occult ideas never really appealed to me. The concept of conquer or fear when that was very, um, I don't know when, when that really grabbed me for the first time, um, it might've been when, like, when I first did the reissue of order from chaos and he wrote the, you know, not the biography, but the description of stillbirth machine, 
And it was whenever when you describe what Conqueror of Fear was, that's that's probably what drew me in. Your description also just Chuck's lyrics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean basically he's like a religious. Well, it was also a lot of that was Helm Camp. Uh yeah, yeah, that was that was uh that wasn't just Chuck, but it was you know a combination of uh Pete Helm Camp and Chuck Killer's philosophy behind this conquer fear concept. Yeah. And so the um I guess going back, I, I guess some other notable relationships you have. I mean, you know, Abigail has worked, you know, you've worked with Abigail on almost every one of their major releases. Yeah. Um, that's a, a strong alliance you have. Yeah. Yasuyuki of Abigail has been very supportive and he's been a friend for a very long time. We did their very first U.S. tour. Um, the, that was a talk about DIY. You know, we just crammed the band into the back of my shitty sedan and drove them from, you know, from the Bay Area all the way down to San Diego. It was and we were setting up gigs in people's houses. We we're sleeping on the floor. You know, it was extremely DIY and but didn't you have a girlfriend at the time who was uh not too oh happy? yeah yeah I mean it was a disaster but it is what it is you know we had everyone staying at the house uh I don't remember which year it was maybe it was like 2003 or something so yeah Ryan Forster came uh Jim Capsalis from Cult of Dayoth came um let's see that's yeah, who else came? Uh Craig from New York City, uh, who doesn't really do anything, but I think he was in the band at the time. Um couple of people. Um oh Luis Macias, he's still in the scene. He actually opened up a record store in Arizona. He came. Oh, Zach, his friend Zach, the guy who drew the Toxic Holocaust logo, he was he was there. He also did the what was the Sabbath record he did the cover of the like with the Gizal cutting hair or something like oh, that? Oh yeah, yeah, that was not my release. That was somebody else's. No, release. That was actually yours. also Louise's artwork too. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, yeah. So that was um, that was that was a magical and also disastrous tour, <laughs> was <laughs> but it was a very good set example. Up shows or set up a tour. I set it up myself. But well, it was, was that the first time? Yeah, it was that? my first attempt at setting it up. So I just flew them in to San Francisco. They might have even paid for their own flights because back then I was just like, you know, it was straight out of college and I didn't have that much money. I was working for Silicon Genetics, but, you know, they were paying me like $40,000 or something. It wasn't very much money after rent and food and stuff like that. So uh, I just made made it work, but... Yeah, that was that was a that was a very interesting tour. Yeah, everyone slept on my floor. My girlfriend at the time, shout out to Tara Fitzgerald if you're out there. She's probably not even into metal anymore because of me. <laughs> yeah, she was not happy with all the testosterone and just dirty men sleeping on the ground. I remember the Abigail guys were surfing the internet for porn, <laughs> like at seven in the morning. It was just not a good scene. It was just, it, it smelled like shit. It, everyone was just tired and sweaty and stinky. So yeah, when we got back from the tour, she was gone. <laughs> and then you also set up uh, Sabbath's first uh, gigs, right? Here in uh, yeah. San Francisco yeah, and then they played Chicago, went to um, Mexico. You and I both went down there for the Mexico shows. Yeah, that was that was DIY, but not as DIY. Um, I don't remember where they slept. I think they didn't sleep that night because, or maybe they did sleep. Well, they the did hotel because because yeah, I remember me and uh, Lou Holycost went to go pick yeah uh, all Lou up at, that morning, there. like four in the morning. Yeah, he opened the door completely naked and just like <laughs> screamed at us. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember which year that was, but that was two thousand five or something. That gig was crazy. We had a Sunder. We had, I think, um, the ripoff artist known as Nockmistium. They played, I think Jeff Whitehead was drumming for them at the time. Black Goat, Bono, pretty much every band that I was working with from the Bay Area played that it was gig. It kind of like a mini fest at the time. Yeah, it was a very strong gig at the Elbow Room. Um, 
thanks to Matt, Matt from Elbow Room, RIP, unfortunately, but I hear he's living happily in Leipzig. So I thought you meant he cool. died. I, I hadn't heard that. No, no, RIP to Elbow that. Room. You know, he's he's like he's he's happily living in uh, Leipzig, and uh, in fact, the Death Worship guys ran into him at a bar. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, he's doing well. Um, yeah, that was that was sold out, and uh, it was a very memorable gig. I remember. Oh yeah, Mobile Sedat also played that gig, and I remember. Uh, Jim something Black happened Goat. with their bass or something, right? No, I, no, Jim Black Goat oh, was yeah. drunk and knocked over the the amps in the middle of their set. And yeah, yeah, up. Jim Black Goat. I wonder what he's up to. He was yeah. a maniac. <laughs> the um, another like long-standing relationship you had that you know took a, a very tragic, uh, very tragic uh, turn was um, Joe Franklin from Goat Lord. Like, oh that yeah, was, that was fucked up. So. Yeah, unfortunately, I won't go into details of that, but and uh, out of respect for the victims of his crime, um, I'll just say that Joe was a really fucked up person in both his artistic life and his, also in his personal life, and he ended up committing a heinous crime towards the end, or at the very end, because it was a suicide by police, essentially. So yeah, um, uh, the Joe that I knew was just a crazy black metal maniac who lived the lifestyle. And when I say lived the work lifestyle, he was he was just taking meth and other other drugs and uh, just living a scumbag lifestyle. The same exact lifestyle that you would expect from somebody who writes Reflections of the Solstice or Sodomize the Goat, you know? He's exactly yeah, that, that person. That interview he did with uh, Marco from Bonal in the Fall to Your Knees pissing zine really right. uh, captures his. Uh, like yeah, I mean, he, he was not lying at all in that, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, it was it's pretty tragic what happened, and I don't I'm still torn as to how I feel about it, but I try to separate the art from the artist, and it wasn't you know Gold Lord wasn't only Joe, it was Ace Still and uh, others in the band. So I still worship Lord to this day, even though what happened with Joe was really fucked up. And I mean, he, you and Joe, I mean, y'all communicated regularly. I mean, he, I, I, I communicated with him somewhat too, but like he actually had sent you, like you have the archive of all of his letters and yeah. like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... He was, you know, he was living the black metal lifestyle, but at the same time, he was kind of like a pack rat. So he kept everything. So when I was writing him um, handwritten letters in the late 90s and early 2000s, he had kept all the letters. And shortly before his passing, he sent me everything that he owned, including his leather jacket, um, the UC and a lot of the old pictures. I got About his the black well in hell. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that one. I got his uh, collection of letters that he had dating back to 86. It's pretty crazy. He was in contact with, uh, you know, the guy from Thorns, Snore, Snore, or whatever his name is. Um, he has letters from Sackis of Rotting Christ when they were a grindcore band. Remember I made that uh, novelty teacher that said, I love noises band <laughs> that was from Sackis. <laughs> Um, yeah, he had, he had like, like letters, letters. Chris and stuff, yeah, right? yeah, he had letters from Chris Viper, he had letters from King Fowley because King Fowley was always a big fan of Goat Lord. In fact, I bought King Fowley's Goat Lord t shirt in the late 90s. Um, yeah, I mean, they, the they, I still haven't gone through every single letter, there's like hundreds of letters in there. Some of them are hilarious, they're like fan artwork for Goat Lord that are fucking ridiculous or like uh some some like uh fan letters from girls that are very sexual <laughs> <laughs> they probably didn't know that you know joe was like 300 pounds or something <laughs> it's this hilarious reading these letters so the i guess the the you know you have these like strong friendships you've developed through the years but there must be incidents and i i don't i'm not gonna ask you to name names but there must be times where you've worked with bands that have 
proven to be a disappointment one way or another, either because of the personality conflicts or or just something went wrong, contracts, that sort of thing. I mean, how, does that ever sour your feelings about the music or about the work you're doing? Or, you know, how, how do you, I guess, how do you deal with those inevitable disappointments when you get to, to you know, when you're running a label this this big? Yeah, um, I think it's impossible to avoid gross behavior when you're dealing with humans. It's just part of it. And I'm sure I've done, you know, if I reflect on my life, I'm sure I've done horrible things in my life that I regret to this day, you know. And I would hope that the bands or individuals that wrong me will come around at some point and make things right. But it does make it hard for me to appreciate their music when they do something shitty. So I think I'll just leave it at that. I try not to dwell on a negative um, coming from a black metal person. It sounds weird, but I try to keep a pretty uh, PMA mindset because otherwise it's hard to continue day-to-day -day operations. So, you know, yeah, uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it is what it is. Things happen. You just move on. Well, now that uh, you're in Texas, you know, things are going well there. You have a, a seems like a much more supportive scene. Um, one thing that you've been uh, focusing on in recent years has been, you know, health and fitness in a way that you didn't when you were younger. Yeah. Um, well, what does that mean to you at this point? As a, this is more of a personal question, not so much about the label, but just but personally. It, it ties in very closely with the label. And I think mind and body fitness is, I mean, I, I just learned it the hard way, right? Like we all kind of take it for granted that we're fit and skinny in our 20s um just it comes more naturally hey that's grim if you're doing that then i might as well do this hold on oh i'm gonna die she weighs a lot here's fat socks fat socks say hi here's yeah, fat socks in the butt <laughs> 3d butt okay all right, sorry, sorry for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, when you're in your teens and twenties, you just kind of take it for granted that your health is, you know, you're you're at your peak fitness or whatever. Um, but as you get older, your life becomes more sedentary. You get a desk job. You have to be sitting on your ass for very long. You start to gain weight around the midsection. Everyone experiences this pretty much, unless you're like a professional athlete or something, or who's somebody who's always been into fitness, like Marco from from um, Witches Hammer and Blasphemy. That guy's always been fit since his twenties. I was not like that. I was pretty fit, you know, when I was a teenager. I played sports, skateboarding, and all that, and I kind of let myself go in college just because we were studying so much and um, I was in my 20s. It wasn't like I was gaining weight, you know, that rapidly. But right after college, you know, around the time that I started a label, I got a job. I was sitting on my ass for hours and hours, basically eight hours on my ass. Um, so I started to gain weight. And by the time I was 40... I was all the way up to like 190 pounds or something. And my doctor told me one day, essentially that I was a fat ass and I was, you know, compromising my health. So by then, you know, I was pretty sedentary. I wasn't like, I wasn't enormously fat, but for my height, five, nine hundred and ninety pounds was definitely overweight. My BMI was way off the charts. Um, because it's not just about the weight, right? Because if, if if I was 190 pounds all muscle, then that would be a different story, but it was not the case, obviously. <laughs> so my fitness journey started in, yeah, it started when I was 40, um, because my doctor told me to do it. 
And at the time, my kid was, you know, she was how old? She was she was pretty little, yeah, right? Because she's 15 now, so, and I'm 28. So, yeah, she was little. So I would take her to the Montclair Park down the street where your car was broken into and everyone else's car was broken into, <laughs> that park. They had a pull-up bar there. They had a little um, playground with monkey bars. And so Mika would play on the monkey bars and then I would just, you know, I had to do something. So I started doing pull-ups and push-ups and, um, you know, squats and whatever. I started to exercise because of my kid and the necessity to go to the playground all the time. So, and I was living a very stressful and busy schedule, just driving to work. You know, I have to wake up at five. I don't know how it is now. I'm sure the traffic is still terrible in the Bay Area, but around then, I mean, this is pre-pandemic. Everyone was commuting to work. The economy wasn't complete shit. So, and, you know, tech companies were still doing very well. They they might still be, I don't know. Um, but the economy was booming. People had to just commute from the cheaper places to the more expensive places where the jobs were, Silicon Valley. Um, and my commute was what, like hour and a half or two hours one way? It was ridiculous. I don't even know how I did it for so many years. From Oakland all the way down to Santa Clara was like hour on a good day. And... Mm -hmm. Sometimes if it rained three hours, it was ridiculous. Yeah. And then so, you'd come home, you'd be packing records and you know, right. It was, I don't even know. I mean, looking back on it, the stamina that took, mm -hmm. you know, and the mental energy it took to do both, just just the commute alone was like going to work. So I think because of that, I needed an outlet that um strengthened strengthened my mind and also my body. So I started to exercise. And uh, um, I think one day I was in Montclair and somebody was doing muscle ups. And then I got obsessed with that. You know how I am. Once I get into something, I just get completely obsessed. You know, it's 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 been metal for many years, but now calisthenics is something that I'm obsessed with. So I treat it like a sport. So when I was a teenager, it was skateboarding and doing tricks on skateboards, you know, ollieing over trash cans or doing tail slides or whatever, you know, it was, it was like doing tricks and, and calisthenics is very similar, especially the Eastern European wing of calisthenics is very similar. You master one skill and then you won't move on to the next. And it takes a lot of practice and, um, mental energy i think to focus on one thing for a very long time and master it and that's what i like about fitness is it's kind of like running a label over the over the years you learn a little bit about what makes it more efficient what works business wise what doesn't how do i work with bands all these little details you learn uh almost like tricks on a skateboard you don't just master it overnight you have to work on it over the course of many years and my you know my new challenge or hobby is calisthenics and uh, fitness in general I try to focus on I never really focused on my spiritual health or my mind but as I get older I'm, I'm more mindful of the fact that if I need to do this for much longer and I do because I don't I can't see myself quitting I just started, I, I'm just starting to open up a factory at age 48. So even 20 years down the road, you know, I'm going to be 68. So that means I have to keep my health going. It's only 20 years, you know, and in 20 years, my kid's going to be only 20 years old. Um, and I want to see that kid grow up and maybe have a kid of his own and take over the business, whatever the case, I want to see more of life so i'm trying to focus on physical fitness and and also my mental health because the only way that i can keep on going is if i keep my keep my uh my mind healthy at the same time so yeah my fitness journey started when i was 40 and it, i've been increasing um 
the reps and I've started to work more on my mental health as well. And there are things that I'm doing now that may sound really weird. Like I, I've always been a morning person, but um, I've never really had any structure. So, and you know me, I'm, I'm all about kind of militaristic regiments. Like once I get into a groove, I try to stick to it. So I've started to introduce new regiments, like waking up at six, putting on my shoes and then just sprinting up the hill because that wakes me up to the point where um, it wouldn't, you know, even coffee doesn't do the same thing. So if anybody out there wants to try it, I would recommend that you just first thing in the morning, like not even before brushing your teeth, put your shoes on and run up whatever hill you can find nearby as fast as you can, as far as you can, and then see how you feel after that. It definitely just, it's like better than caffeine or coffee or anything. So I, I started doing that. Hmm? I beg to differ, but that's... Well, coffee is easier, but um, I think the... I don't know. It must release some endorphins to exercise because I definitely feel better dopamine fix. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you should try it too, Jason. It should. I should. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm still, I'm still in that sedentary life phase. So, you know, we'll, we'll <laughs> you got to get out of that. Yeah. Uh, otherwise you're going to end up like fat socks over here. Just probably <laughs> I've, been, I've been fat before. I'll, I'll, I'll almost certainly be fat again. Ah. But so I guess the, the last thing um, to go over, uh, you know, is just sort of where the the label is and where you see it going um, in the future. Obviously, you've talked about Helios, but but what do you think about NWN in the future and, and also just where music is headed, especially we at the beginning of this conversation, we touched on things like AI and you know, we've talked about the changing of music formats and, you know, you know, vinyl, the kind of resurgence of vinyl, the waning popularity of CDs, the resurgence of cassettes, streaming, all those things. Like, how does all that factor into the big picture for what you see going forward? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the trends that come and go are somewhat outside of my control. I think I have some control over my immediate environment in terms of the scene that I cultivated over the past 24 years. So I will continue to curate the music that I like and try to create a scene around it. I think, you know, I'm sure I've contributed to the resurgence of bestial black metal, right? Because when I was starting out in 2000, 2001, that scene was very small. But over the course of 24 years, now we have like overabundance of this style. And it's it's gone to the point where people call it like goat fago or something. You know, it's just it became kind of silly at some point, just like Norwegian black metal style became silly in the early 2000s with so many Norse core bands and and everyone kind of sounding the same and looking the same. Same sort of thing happened with Bestial Black Metal. So um, I will cons I'll still continue to support the bands that I like, you know, and I'll I'll still release that stuff. But at the same time, I I will release other types of music and try to create and curate a scene that's a little bit more interesting. Um, and I forgot what the other aspect of your question was. Was it? Well, it's just kind of generally speaking, taking everything into account. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. Technology and and where you're yeah. living now. And, I think and technology is a double-edged sword. I mean, we discussed this before. Instagram is a cesspool of shit, but at the same time, it's the easiest way to connect with people. Um, I think it's the best marketing tool out there right now. So and besides all the censorship and down regulation and all kinds of manipulations that happen with tech companies, unfortunately or fortunately, this is, you know, here to stay. There's no way around it. So the best thing to do is to just leverage it as much as you can for your agenda. And my agenda is to spread my filth out there, my taste in music. And I feel like it's working very well. So I'll continue, continue to do that. Um, one thing that I sort of started and I 
I think I've been mindful of this in the past, but was reluctant to do so is um, with, with the ease of technology and recording yourself on the phone and everything, it makes it much easier to put myself in front of the camera. And while I don't like seeing my ugly face on camera and nobody, nobody else does, um, my identity and NWN's identity has always been linked. And in the past, I hid behind the gunman logo, but now I can stand in front of it. And I think this human connection makes a huge difference in the branding of NWN. And I can speak more openly about what I like and what I dislike and how the, how the scene should be shaped. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm like an elder statesman at this point, so I feel like I have the right to say certain opinions about the scene. So I will continue to put my face forward and um, try to brand NWN and the surrounding scene with myself. So that that's one conscious decision I made a couple of years ago that I would try to brand it directly and link it back to myself because at the end of the day, you know, it's always been me. Uh, going back to the beginning, it's always been me. It's just my taste reflected in the the final products. So that's just how it's going to be with NWN. Uh, obviously, with Helios, it's a completely different animal. It's not me. It's not NWN. It's Helios. And Helios is for... Uh, it, it's We don't produce music for anyone in particular, we are producing records for everyone. So the identity of Helios is not me. Um, I'm just a spokesperson right now because I have the biggest audience. My business partner is just in the background because he doesn't really have a presence online. But um, once it's up and running and everything is going smoothly, our goal is to reflect uh, just quality back to the public. It's not. It's not going to be NWN or myself. Well, that's pretty much all I have. Is there anything else you wanted to say? <clears throat> um, no, I think. Uh, I think. Uh, I just want to thank you for doing this interview. Awesome. I know it's it's like two hours out of your day, and you're probably itching to go watch Super Bowl, and everyone else is probably watching Super Bowl right now. <laughs> Um. Yeah, uh, it's not on yet. You you don't actually you don't follow sports, so you have no idea. But no, it's not on yet. <laughs> yeah, I only the I only like skateboarding and calisthenics because I'm retarded. I don't like sports. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Well, I guess I should thank everyone else for listening to this long ass interview. Um, I hope that I was concise to some degree and it wasn't it's not, it's not exactly tucker carlson and vladimir putin but <laughs> i didn't watch that i have no interest Good. yeah um i think i'm more in, more important and interesting fine <laughs> <laughs> now but yeah thank you for uh for the interview and and thank you everyone for listening <laughs>